You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyder's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, Episode 68, Interview with Fern and Audrey. I'm your layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Very good. Good to be here with you, Trey. Well, good. I'm excited. We've got uh, two special guests this week. Yes, we do. We have two very special guests, and I should sort of start off by letting the audience know that this is going to be a little bit different. I mean, the Naked Bible podcast is uh, has been and is about uh, biblical studies content, but listeners will re- remember, recall, that I'm gradually introducing people that I know that utilize the divine counsel material specifically in some very specific way in ministry. And again, for those listeners who have not uh, viewed the divine counsel videos that are on the podcast, sort of, you know, where to start, please make sure you do that. But again, this is going to be another interview where I let uh, my audience know a few people that are important, that are really making an effort to try to use the content. But this is not going to be so much an academic uh, illustration of using the content like our two previous interviews uh, were. Uh, Fern and Audrey use my content in a very uh, specific ministry way that actually is going to overlap, does overlap, with my two novels, The Facade and The Portent. And for those people who have read uh, those books, especially The Portent, uh, the name Fern should be familiar. Uh, What Fern is involved in uh, in the book of what sort of is her frame of reference, her area of expertise that's just hinted at uh, in the book, ministering to a very specific group of people. That's the fern we're going to talk to today is the uh, the person who corresponds to that character. And then Audrey uh, works with Fern uh, to do the same type of ministry. So some of what you're going to hear is going to be pretty strange to your ear. It's going to involve uh, what we, again, loosely refer to as spiritual warfare, but in a way that uh, perhaps you're not going to be accustomed to and have really never heard before. But maybe you will have some some familiarity, and you know, Fern and Audrey are going to be the field experts. Well, Mike, I'm about that. 80% excited and 20% scared, so. <laughs> as you should be. <laughs> and it may increase, that 20% may increase by the end of the show. Yeah, yeah I, I don't have a Yoda voice, or I could have used it there, but uh, that's good. That's good. So we can we can get started. I, I think the best way to start is just to uh, let people know, hey, who are these people being interviewed? So I'm going to ask uh, Fern and Audrey uh, for a self introduction, and we'll start with Fern. Um, I am Fern, and I do exactly what Mike says. Um, Audrey and I work together with a population of people that have undergone severe trauma, human trafficked if you will. And that term is is broad in our definition. It would go from what most people understand and know as being human trafficked and the sex trafficked and um, uh, across the world. But it also includes those who have survived satanic ritual abuse, who have survived governmental experimentation like the Born Identity or MKUltra. And that's the clientele that we work with. And I've come alongside of Fern for the last 11 years, and it is a greatly needed ministry that we do, and we don't know too many out there that do that. So what is it, if you can describe, and I'll I'll let uh, either of you just sort of choose which one answers this, but what is it that you do? What do you do with clients? Okay, so someone would come to see us. Usually there's, um, they find us through word of mouth. We're not on the web, but they'll find us through word of mouth. And typically this person is going to um, be connected with the church in some way. Usually, I would say 90%. We do get some that are not connected to the church. But typical therapy is not helping them. Prayer ministry and churches aren't helping them. They've gone through deliverance ministry. They are the people in the church that just don't ever seem to get functional. And they end up coming to our office and finding out that they have been perpetrated on in a very horrific way. And we start helping them understand the defense mechanism that they created as a child to survive trauma. What is that defense mechanism? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. A child would build a system to endure the trauma without 
um, their heart being harmed in it so that walls are put up inside and they can still maintain through the trauma, but they are... They don't remember it. Yeah, they don't remember it. What do you mean by system? A system is a psychological defense that the child's mind is able to make. All of us live out of defense mechanisms. Defense mechanisms are used typically in a crisis so we can get through a trauma. But the children that are born into trauma, satanic ritual abuse, being used for governmental experimentation like MKUltra, or even being born into use in sex trafficking or human trafficking, they have to survive that level of evil. And so the psychological defense mechanism that is created is the system that they live out of. So typically, the child can't tolerate the evil, so the first split is a good-bad split. So, mm -hmm. I was going to say now you okay you, now you've used the word split. So in, in the novel, specifically in the portent, and again, so it's alluded to a little bit in the facade. I talk about dissociation, dissociative identity disorder. So just for the sake of our audience, we have that term. We have split. We have system. So can you explain what it is that someone? who's being traumatized, what they actually do, what their brain does, what their mind does uh, to cope with this. You know, in other words, explain these terms. Audrey? In the child's mind, they the splitting would be that someone takes, someone, there would be, well, I mean, someone inside endures the bad and someone stays good. There has to be a division inside the mind. So essentially their their mind sort of creates another part, mm -hmm. some some uh, alternative person or alternative consciousness or whatever, whatever it is we want to describe it. And you, you guys will know the best terminology for that. But their mind essentially goes to a different place so that they don't have to uh, be actively enduring whatever the trauma is. Is that correct? Yes. I would probably say that that child in, a, in an overwhelming situation in in her mind creates a way to survive it whether it be maybe she's female maybe it's a male part it is answers the question how can i get through this it's problem solving at a really creative level mm -hmm. now this used to be referred to as uh, multiple personality disorder and that sounds pejorative you know, like there's something wrong. But uh, if I understand uh, both of you correctly, and again, how you minister to people, this parting or this splitting isn't a disorder, but it's a response to trauma, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about a little bit more about why you don't like the, the multiple personality lingo? Say something about that. Um, I would probably say the 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 biggest problem that I would have with the lingo is the um, sensationalized idea of what that is mm -hmm. in, um, you know, that's out there in the public of Sybil, Sybil or the three faces of Eve. Mm -hmm. It's just not like that for what we see and how the defense mechanism works for the person to survive trauma. And, you know, to, to more generalize it, Every people, everybody in in humanity uses a fraction of that defense mechanism. When they say, "Well, a part of me wants to do this, and a part of me wants to do that," it's just much more elaborate for someone who's se endured severe trauma. So they have to have definite things that are different. The other reason why we look at it as pejorative is because. What happens, um, at least in the church world of inner healing and um, ministry, there is a divide of who they can help is how they, they present it. The divide is um, those who are DID are like, this method won't work for you because it's just too much. It's too overwhelming. It's too unknown. And I really don't, we really don't look at it as that way at all. It is a defense mechanism. The child has to be brilliant in order for the mind to do that kind of splitting and has to be really hanging on to life and tenacious to build an entire system to say, I'm going to do life. I'm going to live. And so really they're 
they're the heroes, the heroines of of choosing life. Does the, does the repetition of offense have anything to do with this? In other words, the, the number of times a person is traumatized have anything to do with this? Certainly, yes. Okay. And in fact, when the trauma is being um, purposefully perpetrated, the perpetrator is trying to build something in the end. They see what the child can do, and they see how the child can split and how creative that child is. And so the defense mechan- mechanism that God gives that child to survive it, the perpetrator takes that and locks the child in captivity in it. So you're saying that with some some perpetrators, there's actually a very intentional sort of agenda or goal behind the way they're traumatizing their victim. Yes. Okay. And I, I have two questions. What can you just very generally give us some of the goals, some of the things that the, the person being traumatized are told? And, and I take it that's where the, the terminology of programming factors into this. In other words, they're told certain things or to do or, or to convince themselves that something is true. Uh, so what are some of those goals, those endpoints that you've come across? And what does this actually look like in terms of a just a person you would meet? In other words, would I be able to sort of visually detect someone who uh, has been traumatized and has responded to it this way? Um, I don't remember your first question, so I'll... The first question is, what are, what are some of the, the endpoint goals oh, of the perpetrator okay. that you've sort of stumbled across as you, treat, you know, as you minister to people? Go ahead. Well, in the human trafficking realm, that would be to create a person who will perform sex acts for people mm-hmm. over and over again. They mindlessly will perform that because that's what they've been, um, their mind's been controlled to do. The other piece I would say that to to start the process as a child, in order for them to get them into spiritual captivity early, would be in like Satanism, uh, they'd have a two or three year old in a ritual, kill a baby, and they would tell that little child that they just killed baby Jesus. And so Jesus and I mean, God has nothing to do with them now. So in that little child's mind, She's toast. She's just everything else that happens after that in the little two, three-year-old mind. God's not there. God doesn't care. She killed baby Jesus. He so that's turned, He turned his back on her. Yes, he turned his back on her. So don't even ask. So now this child is left to herself to survive this evil coming at her. So she just builds a very strong solar system in her mind, and she can survive anything. I'm on my own. I can do it all by myself. I can't. I can't trust anyone. What? Um, one. One last question, as far as and the, the kind of things you encounter. Even though I'm sure we'll return to that at some point. How do you detect this stuff? In other words, uh, someone comes to you, and what do they tell you? Oh, I know I was traumatized at age whatever. Or do they sort of have this vague suspicion that something is wrong? I mean, in other words, how much of this do they know? And there's got to be a, a certain amount they know sort of on the surface themselves. But then how do you, how do you get to other information about what, what's really going on here? Your other question earlier was, could you detect them? And, yeah. and I would say, no, that is the other piece to this. When there is purposeful perpetration to have a child split create a system and live out of that system. One of the goals of that system to see if it's really, if it's a good system is to be totally undetectable. There's not going to be any kind of leak through or any kind of anything else, anything other than superhuman, anything other of capable. So when they come to us, usually what we're seeing is that the church is frustrated with them. Nothing's working. Um, the deliverance teams can't get the demons out of them. So yeah, something's wrong unquote, with this. Yeah. Right. Quote, unquote. Yeah. And I would say they come to get help at the church or to us is because that system is breaking down. And they're not as undetectable as the system was designed to be. Mm-hmm. Now, not all of them know that at all. They just know I'm not functioning in this and I used to do it really well. And that's how it'll begin. And some things with like dreams and just like, 
real quick flashbacks, bizarre thoughts, just kind of intrusive thoughts. And they just are, they're trying to love God and they're trying to serve him. And yet there's a, a an injection of just something defiling and, and overwhelming. Let's transition a little bit. What, uh, what's your connection to me? I mean, uh, listeners are naturally going to wonder, well, okay, I, especially if you've read the novel, I, okay, I'm a little bit familiar with this. I sort of know that there's a real person behind, you know, actually, you know, a team behind Fern uh, in the book. But how did, how did we meet? You know, how, in other words, what's the connection? What's the history between you two and me, if you can talk about that? Audrey and I are in the midst of the ministry, and we're using the best tools that we have at the time, and they really were the best tools for this kind of ministry. And we were comfortable with saying it's not working. And we really got tired of doing what wasn't working. And we were listening to um, the folks coming to see us, you know. And, and and so some of our clients were the ones that said, hey, have you heard of Mike Heiser? And they, in fact, they contacted you first um, about some things. And so I just kind of checked you out. And I invited you here for a seminar. And Audrey and I had the seminar in 2010. And... We just wanted to hear what you had to say. Didn't quite understand it. And that's when you offered to us the teaching of the Divine Council. And it was in that, those three days, that it was a game changer for us. It just literally made sense. As we listened to those who came to us, what they were saying is what you were saying. But they told the captivity of it. And you told us the freedom, the freedom of it, the, the truth of what this was. So basically the the whole notion of there's a supernatural world that's much bigger than angels and demons. There are, you know, multiple Elohim, the gods uh, of the Old Testament, the biblical world, were, they, they, they believe they were real. They are real. This is Paul. This is what's behind Paul's language, principalities and powers. But most of all, that the crucifixion was really the central event to reverse what goes on in Genesis 3 to reverse uh, the whole, the, uh, the events of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and how all that sort of spilled into Old Testament history, and the division of the nations being put under the sons of God, all that stuff, what I hear you saying, was, you, you were getting snippets of that from the people who actually came to you. Mm -hmm. They understood the domination of of stars over them, of watchers over them. They understood the the hubris attitude and of, of that realm, and they would tell us the different attributes that they would see. And when you explained that some of the iconography, the depictions of these higher level beings had faces and what the, the iconography looked like, this is what our folks were telling us. Now, we've talked about this, but if you could share a little bit with it. You've referred to a couple of things in the novels, I think more so the portent, that actually sort of were kind of bridges or touch points with certain things you've seen. So could you mention a few of those? Like the Sabi thing? Yeah. I mean, again, for those who haven't read the portent, that's too bad. You're just going to have to go back and read okay. it and read this. I don't want to ruin your reader's um, excitement of this. First of all, I think the first thing important specifically was that when we, you know, when Audrey and I read the important Colonel Ferguson, we get Colonel Ferguson just because some of our folks come to us and the trauma inflicted on them to create a whole system to live out of, a, a shattered mind to live out of with a, a strong system. They were being wounded and um, traumatized, programmed, if you will, to no longer have a sense of self so that they would be Colonel Ferguson. Sort of a, you, you've used the term walk-in, right. so that they could essentially be personally dominated by, you know, whatever you know entity is behind this. Correct. And we even saw that in the facade when you had, you know, the, the beans kind of throw people, I mean, that's, that language, that conversation is normal in our office. So that was a strong connection, you know, that we're like, yeah, we have these people come to us. The other one was in spiritual warfare there, because we have those people come to us, this, the level of spiritual warfare is just there. 
And there was this one incidence where it was um, getting tense and all of our charismatic evangelical tools that we knew to do, nothing worked. And we had just been reading before the portent was um, released. We were reading it as you gave us the, the manuscript. And I had just read what Sabi said to Colonel Ferguson. And I'm sitting there. It's not going well in the office and done everything I have prayed. I've read scripture. I've, we've sang, we said, Lord, do something. Finally, I just sat back in my chair and I just said, the Lord rebuke you, watcher. And, and he, then, did, yeah, he snarled and snarled and stomped and then gone. It wasn't an immediate magical, oh my gosh, it's gone. He, he did exactly, exactly what Colonel Ferguson did, mm-hmm. threw a little fit and then left. And I want you to know, we took a little break there. <laughs> <laughs> we just took a little break. Yeah, well, you probably deserved it. <laughs> so, you know, for for those, again, who this is totally new turf, and you brought up the deliverance ministry thing, someone would naturally ask, well, what's the difference between this and deliverance ministry? Can mm. you get into that? Deliverance ministry is when someone is being oppressed by the demons, and maybe it's because grandma sinned and that demon is there because of grandma, or there's just something they've done and maybe they lied or played with a Ouija board or anything. There's a whole list of what deliverance ministers take people through, anything that could have been possibly an open door, quote, for demonic oppression. demonic oppression. And so then you just sit there and you go through the renunciation. I repent for doing this and ask, you know, any any demons that are associated. Some deliverance ministers talk to the demons to get a name and get a the the lead demon and get there's all kinds of creative ways that they do this and um it has been part of my history you know that i that is kind of the teaching that i've been in and never really bought it but when you're dealing with the severely traumatized that that have parts that had to be strong that had to be acoustic what happens with this this group of people is that going into a deliverance ministry for ministry, they end up that a part of them comes out and says, you know, who do you think you are? You know, you're not touching this. Well, they'll try to cast out a part of the person. And for the deliverance minister, they think this is an obnoxious demon. So they get stronger in accosting this thing to get out. You've got mm-hmm. to listen to me in the name of Jesus. And so people come to Audrey and I that they have suffered severe uh, spiritual abuse. And it takes us probably maybe three months to say, you know, we're, we're not going to come at you. Mm-hmm. We really just want you to know you and we're going to help you do that. And in the process, there's going to be spiritual freedom. Right. So instead of going through a series of renunciations, uh, either verbally recited or something that you deliverance person would have them read or whatever, your approach is what? How do you? Instead of renouncing something, what do you want them to do? Have the understanding of the 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 divine counsel. What you've given us the information of that there's a Yahweh and sons of God and the angels, and knowing that we displace the sons of God, and that's why they're venomously angry with humans. Right. So because of because of the ultimate destiny of believers, the, again, the evil, let's just make it general, the evil that's accosting them, mm-hmm. uh, that's, why, that's why they're targeting this person. There's an animosity because this entity knows it's, it's doomed, knows it's going to be displaced by that person, mm-hmm. you know, since they're a believer. And so they just basically seek to ruin. Mm-hmm. And so where the deliverance model is taking authority and casting them out, we're giving them, the people that see us, the understanding of who they are in Christ. And that the displacement of the evil, we rightfully sit right with Yahweh and they can't do anything about it. It's done already at the cross. So the the already not yet kind of thing that's part of the, the, the destiny of the believer has been important. 
Yes. The belief of them is that they had to sit under this um, evil and they were the evil had power over them. It's completely changed with the understanding that their power is null. I think that's the biggest part of it. When a, a survivor understands the divine council worldview from just that perspective, they get domination of, of small g gods over them. They've lived it. They've been attached to it. And um, when they see that in the divine council, the divine council worldview and what the cross has done for them, they know the cross, that it's done. The cross really has done it. And there isn't any deliverance. There is just a, an understanding that thing moves back. There is a change. Now we have that person who gets to think on their own now. And so now we help with, okay, do you need the defense mechanism anymore? Let's work on that now. So it's not like dissociation is magically healed. The captivity is moved back, is done. They get it. It's not something that they have to work hard at attaining it. And then, then they can start thinking about, you know, who they are, where, what are their gifts? And you start, they start their understanding what else is held in captivity, their gifts, mindsets, you know, and other things. So they already have the basis in the divine council understanding. And they get the reversal thing. They get reversals. You know, yeah, when you that, taught us about reversals, they get reversals. Yeah, and for, for listeners, what is being referred to here uh, is, you'll get little snippets of this in Unseen Realm, but what we mean by reversals is how, or how certain biblical events at certain places or how certain statements in, in Scripture, and, and really even how, uh, certain episodes in the Bible are laid out. They're done, they're written, they're crafted very deliberately to reverse specific elements of evil in the Old Testament. And one of the more common is, is how an episode in the New Testament or a statement is targeting, like the Genesis 6, 1 through 4, Sons of God episode. That this story is here specifically because it acts as a reversal of that sin and its effects. So in the portent, an example of this would be the scene where the characters are discussing the genealogies of Jesus. Why are these four women in the genealogy? And they all have something in their backstory that has a hook into the nature of the sin back in Genesis 6. And so by putting these women into the genealogy of Jesus, the person who will ultimately undo this evil, there's a, there's a messaging there. There's a reversal messaging that is sort of encrypted into the genealogy of, Je genealogy of Jesus. Again, there are other things in the portent like that. There are other things in the unseen realm like that. But that's what uh, Fern is talking about, that, again, this has mattered to the people that they, they minister to when they start learning these things. You know, frankly, it, I think you could boil it down to this is, this is just good biblical theology helping people to not believe lies. Um, yeah. I was going to say that. I mean, yet that's even in the church where people say, I know Jesus is enough, but why is this, why is this this way? The cross was supposed to be enough, but, and in applying the divine counsel, understanding and where they sit in Christ in that placement is what's being missed for a lot of those folks too. That's actually a, I think a good transition to this question. And it, it's a bit of a touchy one, but what are some things that, again, people you see have been told either in counseling, in a church setting, or just generally the sort of theology they absorb uh, in certain church settings that actually contributes to their being in bondage? Can you give us an example of that? Things that really need to be unlearned, theology that needs to be unlearned uh, to really help move this along. Uh, pray more. Read your Bible more. You're you not getting. Be, you must be doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes they'll um, be told that they'll have to renew their mind. So read these scriptures over, put them on your mirror in the bathroom and do this. And what to someone who is trauma based mind controlled, and that's another word for what we've been talking about, trauma based mind controlled, they're looking at that as just another way to to condition or to program their mind. So they already have this captivity of their mind 
you know, from a child on up. And now they're just um, told to take scripture and apply that over top. That, that's so confusing for them because these are people that have never learned how to think or to what to differentiate their own thoughts, to be connected to their body. They have been taught to stay in another realm. So it, it, it sounds to them like I'm trying to find a, a good a good term for this. It's obviously not producing another part, but it just sounds to them like uh, putting like the religious game. world on top of it. Okay. So in, instead of addressing the problem, it's just another layer. Sort of. And what happens because they're so desperate to understand what's going on with them in a counseling or a ministry session, when they hit this, that, okay, we have to now do scriptures, they're terrified that they're going to be um, sent out. And uh, if you don't, if they don't do it, they'll be uh, rejected. Reje- and so they'll, if they need to make a part that'll learn scripture, They'll make a part to learn scripture because the fear of abandonment and rejection is so, is more terrifying. Yeah, it's more terrifying than just using the dissociation that they know how to do. Do you, uh, another question that might pop into a, a listener's mind, do you, are you connected to a specific church or tradition? Is, you know, what, what, what's your history with that? Like, are you ordained? Are you this? Are you that? I mean, is this an issue of credentialing and, and church authority? I mean, how sort that out for listeners? No, no, neither Audrey nor I are ordained. And we do church five days a week, 40 hours a week. We stay real connected to people that love us and understand what we do. Typically in a church setting, there's not a great understanding of this. They kind of would rather not have all these messy people there. So, Neither Audrey or I attend church, but we do love Jesus Christ very much. It's not about um, any kind of credentialing or ordination. It really is about loving people and understanding that the cross really has um, set everyone free and that there is this realm that people are are held in captivity in. Now you, you've told me before, again, that you had, again, uh, attachments to churches and for lack of a better way of putting it, what you do just didn't jive <laughs> no. you know, with, with that context. Right. Churches are afraid of Satanists. They're really terrified to say that they have a Satanist in their church. So when when some of my our folks started going to the church that I attended, I, I was really nicely asked to leave. They just didn't understand. But that happened twice. And then I just said, I, I just am going to hang with these people. I really felt like David. I had the cave of Adullam. You know, Audrey and I are just at the cave of Adullam, the distressed. And, you know, I just, and we just, we just hung there with them. These are very gifted people and very mercy filled, loving people. And, um, so rather than having to battle the church and to help them get a different perspective on it, it was just really easier to stay connected with those like you, Mike. And, and we have a, we have a core group of others that we really just, um, hang with and stay in. So basically, people would come to you, and you'd you'd naturally take them to church. Yep. Yep. Get them, them in the to, community. Right. Make make them part of that, but it just it freaked people out. Oh, they would say that. Oh, this is what you know. The occult in the area sent this person in to destroy the church, and I and I said, look, if this is you know one hundred and one, this should be this should be easy. If they only sent one, you know, can you handle one? This is not this is not <laughs> a big deal. Let's love them, and and it, it was it was terrifying. What do you think the best uh, spiritual warfare tool is? Again, you, we've talked about how you don't do renunciations. You've talked about how doctrine, again, biblical theology has been real effective, again, and, and biblical theology specifically that is in touch with the supernatural perspectives, divine counsel perspectives of the original biblical writers. But what do you think, you know, if you could give me the short list, what, what are the, what's the best tool? You know, what, what's your go-to thing? What that gives you good results. I think the imagery that you develop in the portent with Sabi mm-hmm. is the best there is. When you are just saturated yeah. in an understanding of the good news of the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ and who we are, and just be able to sit in that level of love that Sabi had. I mean, that the way you you portrayed it, they spit on him and all that. And he just sat there smiling. I'm like, and, and to show the physical weakness of Sabi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that was a big goal. And that's what it's about. Mm-hmm. That, that 
sitting back and just knowing how much Jesus loves this person with that big thing on them and just going after Jesus's heart to that heart of that child, that person sitting in front of us, there is nothing more powerful than that. Yeah. Love drives away evil. That love of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does this work on a uh, sort of a day-to-day level? That's another way of saying, how busy are you guys? Well, we work 40 hours a week doing this. Year-round? Do you take take any time off? Um, We take vacations, but it we squeeze vacations in, but we're, we're busy and we do not, we don't have a website. We don't market at all. It's through word of mouth. We have people come from all over the United States, some Europe, Canada, Australia, they find us more busy. That, that probably surprises listeners that I can, I can just imagine, you know, someone sitting there listening to this thinking, do you mean to say that there are so many of these people, not just sort of out there, but that actually find you that this is literally a full-time job for two people i mean that that would probably astonish you know listeners so give us an idea again based on your experience of i mean how many people do you turn away how how many don't you don't have time for how big of a problem is this i i think it's huge Mm -hmm. i don't know numbers someone i read read one time one in ten i don't really know what the stats are how would you know they're totally undetectable how would you uh, answer this question outside of what you do, which, again, a lot of people are going to parse as you know, right or wrong. And sometimes it's going to be right. Sometimes it's going to be wrong. But uh, what you do is sort of work with demonization, you know, some sort of intelligent evil behind the, the trauma being committed. If people aren't involved in that kind of ministry, what value uh, would you say that divine counsel thinking and the way you've been able to apply it, how can the average person benefit from that? In other words, what what good is this for them? I think, first of all, to recognize that our culture is a spiritual culture. It's not a godly spiritual culture, but it is a spiritual culture. I don't personally have television, but my understanding is on TV, there is more spiritual kind of paranormal you know, things out there. And I think the church has to have an answer, and it has to be a good one. It has to be the right one. And the divine counsel, worldview, understanding just what is in our Bible is just so solid. And it really makes the gospel really good news. I mean, the gospel was really good news before I understood the divine counsel, but this is really good news. And so for the church, if we're going to be the ones, instead of, you know, pack our raisins and head to the, the hills, if we're going to be the ones that are going to stay here and and make a difference, the light get lighter, the dark gets darker, we really need to understand what the love of Christ does for us. And, and the divine counsel worldview that we are presented before the cloud of witnesses that that this is it, kingdom of heaven, in the people we meet, this is this makes the difference for me. I would agree. The understanding for the everyday person, it would unlock things in their heart that they would not have had unlocked because they'll understand just how much Jesus loved everyone. And Audrey, you always say that they're already in a battle. Explain that. Yeah. I mean, we all are in spiritual warfare every day. It's a battle that evil wants to take humans out. And most people walk around and don't realize it. It's happening every day. And it doesn't have to be the mindset there's a demon behind everything. No. There's a divine counsel mindset about it all. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, that, that brings up a point that I wanted to ask. And, you know, I certainly appreciate Fern, you and Audrey are on the front lines of the spiritual war, but how much of it is is a coping mechanism for people who have suffered trauma, whether mental or physical, and then compared to how much is an actual demon evil possession, per se? Uh, Trey, that's a really good question. There, it's, it's, a, it's a layering. And um, I think that the child's response in a coping mechanism is a reaction that God gave. It's, it's a, just a loving thing that God gave the child and every person dissociates. It's just a to what uh, level, to what degree. Mowing your yard and buzzing out and say, "Oh, it's done already." That's dissociation. Driving down the road and say, "Oh, I missed." You know, there's the exit already. That's dissociation. So the defense mechanism is happening. Trey, what happens is we're talking about purposeful perpetration of trauma on a child 
So it's so overwhelming that because they want the child to grasp the unseen realm entities to make it. And they want to put the programming and the ideology in on the child that God doesn't want them. They're unredeemable. And I was talking to Mike the other day. I think that's Revelation 18, the captivity of the bodies and souls of men. The uh, driving thing is how I first learned to sort of understand this, because I've had plenty of episodes on road trips where my body basically just goes on autopilot. And your mind is literally somewhere else. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, I'm I'm here. I don't really remember how I got here, but I got here safe. I I must have known what I was doing here. (laughs) Otherwise I would have crashed. But my mind was just somewhere else. And what what took an hour seemed like three or four minutes. You know, there's just that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you're saying that this is is sort of a a God-given ability that we all have. But when someone's deliberately traumatized, again, this is... This is how it's coped with. But depending on why they're being traumatized, there could be something really sinister, you know, at, at a spiritual level. Correct. Yes. And I think that evil's goal would be to render the kingdom of God useless in those humans. They're not usable for the kingdom of God in a mind controlled program state. Right. And again, the, the programming idea of here's a litany or maybe even one really big lie about you, about God to believe, and they become entrapped by this and and really enslaved by it. Right. And again, the the more it just continues, uh, the more, the deeper it can be, the more bizarre it can be, but they're they're just rendered, like you said, useless, Uh, really just non-functional in any sort of, you know, spiritual sense as as a Christian. Uh, I have to ask what sort of, criticism do you get? I mean, my impression is, and really more than an impression since I've known uh, you both for, you know, four four years or so, is that not a lot of people know that this is what you do. But I have to think that, you know, you have a circle of contacts of people doing similar things. And there's some disagreement or some criticism that uh, might, you know, just be out there. So if you can share one, two sorts of things that you have to address, you have to correct maybe a misperception or a criticism about this, what would it be? Um, first of all, that there, this population is too messy to deal with. I think these are people that have strong gift sets for the body of Christ. So typically what we find in meeting people in churches or even, you know, people we come in contact socially and they ask, you know, what do we do? We typically just tell them we work with folks who have human traffic because that's kind of become the the vogue ministry to support right now. And in a a sense, those who have dealt with uh, and survived trauma-based mind control, purposeful, perpetrated trauma to split the person, his mind, to make someone who is able to be controlled by their mind. People don't understand, so we just kind of stay away from, from that and we'll just tell people that we work with folks who have been human human trafficked because I can't I can't do the battle on the front line and try to um, do the battle with try to help people understand. Right, it's just it's it, it it would be a resource drain or a time drain. It you know, and I know that what that what Audrey and I do kind of is right there thrown in the conspiracy theory bucket, and so it's it's exhausting to do that. It would be ex- it, of resources. It's exhausting. Where, where does exorcism come in? I mean, is there a point that you get to that something like that needs to be applied as treatment? Um, and Trey, that's kind of what we're talking about when we were mentioning um, deliverance ministry. Um, the kind of antique view would be an exorcism. That would be the word probably. Um, and again, exorcism does not look like that at all. We really, it looks more like what it is in the portent. We just rest in God's love. We kind of really connect with the person's heart where that entity is oppressing the person. And we just stay connected to the person's heart. And we really just very quietly not yelling there's no flailing there's no objects flying in the room we just no say, holy water no it's we just say you know the lord rebuke you watcher does the entity ever come up and have a conversation with you during treatment 
I don't typically involve conversation, but yes, they will try to have us cross out of love, whether it would be they try to, to they'll, the per, it'll look like, Trey, it'll look like the person is being, anta- like a part is being antagonistic towards me. They'll swear, they'll this, and we understand the person's heart. So then we'll just kind of rest back. If, if you kind of draw out, they're drawing a line and saying, if you draw out and go towards that line, you've lost. So you just stay back in love and you stay connected to that person's heart where the Spirit of God dwells in that person and you just continue exactly what Sabi d- did, just addressed what the what Yahweh once done in that moment. And it will, it, it leaves. Yeah, because the, what you're describing, I mean, we've all either seen on YouTube or you hear about uh, exorcisms, typically maybe a Catholic priest or in some deliverance context. And it's always a lot of shouting. It's always involving some sort of renunciation. It's always say this or that thing. No. And and you're saying we don't do any of that. No. And, and in fact, what happens is when you have a flail. And that's also where the understanding of divine counsel comes in. See, when the person understands their authority, then they can make a choice of their own. And that and those entities, they they don't have power. It goes back to whom do you serve, right? At that moment, they're choosing whom they're going to serve because they have their mind. See, when you have a typical exorcism kind of thing going on and you've got someone that has a full-blown perpetrated system and they're living out of all these different people, now you're, you're saying, you know, you got to renounce this and you're all the flailing is that person's system under siege trying to get away. It's not demonic. Right. They're, they're just, you're attacking their defense mechanisms. Exactly. You're their coping mechanisms. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So basically, you're, it's the wrong target. Exactly. But the person comes away feeling spiritually abused. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that, that certainly isn't going to help. Do you have uh, any other questions, Trey? Um, so many, but yet so little time. I don't even know where to start. I mean, I think that last part helps clear it up because the majority of people, including myself, we have this preconceived notion of what the treatment entails, like you said, a typical exorcism or whatnot. But so articulating how you're doing it, I think is, is, is bringing light to how, how it should be done or, or what you're doing. And, and so going into it, I didn't know it, and now I do. So I, I think we've accomplished something major there. For me personally, and I know some listeners will absolutely walk away knowing that. But uh, I don't know, Mike. I, <laughs> I got to collect my thoughts. I think my, my I'm now ninety percent excited, ten percent scared. So, uh. <laughs> well, I should I should add you know, before we we wrap up that my my role in all this sort of thing is again starting back with the first meeting is when. Uh, Audrey and Fern invite me to, you know, come out to where they, they have their ministry. We'll have some teaching time, we'll have Q&A, we'll work through topics. It's more or less sort of a, what else can we learn and how could this be useful? And again, trying to trying to work at questions that, you know, may or may not be uh, apparent or transparent. But, you know, it's sort of a, a, a collective Let's put our heads together. Again, how do we think you know, well uh, theologically about this or that aspect of the spiritual world, the unseen realm, and what you guys do? Yeah, and I'll ask Fern and Audrey both. Uh, is there something you want all of our listeners to walk away from this conversation with that, that whether it be if we're being afflicted with DID or uh, you know what we can do going forward? I mean, is, what do you want us to take away from this conversation? There is... There is hope and there is help, mm-hmm. and and you have a lot to teach us. Mm-hmm. And I would say that um, their heart's always been protected, and and they don't need to fear their own self. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks for for doing this. I don't know. Is this a first? This is the for, first for both of you. Okay. Is it well, too I, late? Is it too late to revisit one thing that sure, I think is important? Go ahead. It was back to the criticisms. Mm-hmm. And I think it's really important that people understand we, we get a lot of criticisms of, oh, you're, do, we, with you doing this, you get retaliation as far as in your personal lives. Oh, this was a result from you working with people who are uh, under attack from spiritual realm. So you'll have retaliation. And we just have a different perspective on that with the understanding of divine counsel and knowing that 
um, the place that we sit and darkness is, is done for, we don't look at retaliation like that. It's not, it's everyday life stuff that isn't chalked up to darkness one here. Yeah, I don't even think we, fr- we don't even frame it as retaliation. Right. It, it's it's not a mindset. In a deliverance mindset, if their plumbing went wonky, they would say, oh, that's retaliation. Or their car had a flat tire. Oh my gosh, I got so retaliated on because that person got set free. And that's just not a mindset that we have. Right. And I mention it because if there's listeners out there who are working with you know, these types of folks or interested in it, or they have a heart for it, and that's a fear, I wanted to address that. Mm-hmm. So you, you're not there at all. No. And it's not just because you're you're tough. No. <laughs> you're not like bring it on, we can handle it. Not at no, all. No, not at all. Doing the day. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thanks for, for doing this. And and you know, now that I know this this is a, a first for you, uh I, I you guys gave me a first. Fern and Audrey, their little their little conference event several years ago was the first the first Christian thing. I was ever invited to do when it came to teaching somebody about the divine council. I hadn't been on a radio show, hadn't been invited to a church. This was the very first thing uh, that I did. So we're returning the favor. <laughs> well, mm-hmm. Thanks Thank for the you. first. <laughs> yeah. Well, we really appreciate Fern and Audrey's work that they do to help people and for taking the time to talk with us and bring some much needed light to these issues. Mike, is there anything else you have coming up that you would like to discuss? Yeah, I should uh, issue one more reminder. Uh, it, we're getting close to the uh, event I'm going to be at in Missouri, uh, October 2nd and 3rd in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, specifically at um, the university up there. So if you're in the area, you know, please, you know, make an effort to come. It's two days. If you can only come one day, that's fine. But again, just so that we don't miss it, if you want specific details, just go to my website, drmsh.com slash events, and you'll be able to find uh, the links there on October 2nd and 3rd to where it is, uh, what the agenda is, what the speaking schedule is, what the topics are, all that sort of thing. Well, good deal. Well, I really enjoyed this uh, show, and I'm looking forward to more like these. I think the interviews Mm -hmm. are, are, are really fun to do, and I know our listeners certainly enjoy it. Yeah, yeah, I like them too. (laughs) <laughs> well, then I guess we'll keep doing it. All right. Well, again, I just want to say thank you to Fern and Audrey for everything they do and taking the time to talk with us. And with that, thank you for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.